You're listening to an Anazal Ministries podcast. Have you ever watched the Star Wars movies and said to yourself, man, I really wish I knew more about that character. Or man, I really wish we had more time with that character. Well, if you are that person, then you have found yourself in exactly the right place. Welcome back to Systematic Geekology. We are your priest to the geeks. I am Joe, one of your hosts, and I am joined with the man himself, TJ. How are we doing? Great, great. I definitely didn't just wake up. <laughs> I'm excited to talk about the man. Yeah, th- so today we are talking about one of my favorite characters from the prequel series, Darth Maul. And I remember when I first saw the F- the Phantom Menace, I was just it was like it was like a moment for me when you just have this dude who looks like Satan himself and and you can any Star Wars fans can see the in their mind's eye the scene right the one side side of the of the lightsaber and then the second side of the lightsaber and just man it was phenomenal because all you had seen up until that point if if you went the route that many of us did of watching a new hope empire and return of the jedi and then phantom menace then all you really saw from the Sith, which really wasn't even a a phrase yet, was the Emperor and Darth Vader. This was one of the first exposures out of the big two of somebody else who was practicing the dark side and was proficient with a lightsaber and all of those kinds of things. And the fact that they made him so stylized was just that they, they capitalized on a moment in time with a visual representation and then that lights that double bladed lightsaber that just i mean chef's kiss incredible it, darth maul is probably tied for my favorite star wars character ever so watching the phantom menace just seeing this dude the by far the coolest character so far you know silently just all hands with his yeah. awesome double bladed lightsaber you know i i've loved him since i was a kid i remember I was at church camp one year. I was probably like six and they were doing face painting because we had a little carnival at the end. And I was like, can you can you paint my face like Darth Maul? She couldn't. She had no idea who that was, but she still tried based off of my explanation. And I don't have any pictures, but I'm pretty sure it looked terrible. That's funny. Yeah, I tried the one year for Halloween to dress up as Darth Maul. um, And I had like little suction cup horns and did like I had somebody do like face paint that kind of looked like a great value version of Darth Maul but you know what it was better than nothing yeah so we've been going through we we started with with talking about Obi-Wan and we're continuing on the conversation of doing some of these deep dives into some of the characters throughout this fandom that we all love and i think one of the powerful things about some of these characters that really s- generates a lot of buzz is this idea that there's there's almost an air of mystique to some of these characters that we that leaves us wanting more and so especially when you look at somebody like Darth Maul who was introduced and was seemingly killed at the end of episode 1 but then come to find out both in legends continuity and the recognized continuity he has a continued storyline throughout um extend, extending onward and to to follow with a lot of what happens with Darth Maul you have to watch he's a big fixture in a lot of the cartoon materials and things like that where we see okay so what happens to this guy that has been basically bred at a young age 
to be a Jedi killer that who is defeated by a Jedi and left for dead, what happens to this guy as he goes forward? And we come to find out that that hatred that he has and that mission statement that he has kind of goes from being all encompassing to, you know, destroying all Jedi to pretty singularly focused on the first character that we covered, Obi-Wan. Yeah. Yeah. So he, in the, in the Phantom Menace, he dies and then he does a move that I really respect, except for, you know, the staying alive just out of sheer hatred and spite. Uh, he gets cybernetic legs that make him taller, which one of the many reasons why I like this character, because that's something I can definitely understand. I would do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. But if you if you're listening to this and you just don't really understand why we like Darth Maul so much, you have to watch the Clone Wars and Rebels. Rebels isn't as important. But if you want to see the conclusion to a story, you have to watch Rebels. But there to me, there's not a single character cooler than Darth Maul. Right. There just isn't from from start to end. He is just a solid tier above everybody else. And if you're talking about good lightsaber fights, I think all of the best lightsaber duels in the series come from Darth Maul. Like my top 10 is all Darth Maul fights. Yeah, that. So so for me, one of my biggest complaints about the the prequel trilogy is the all of the the stuff that's going on in episode one between the characters between the the settings and all of that that they they started off well but then jumped so far off of that by episode two that it it just it, it left something wanting you know what I mean? And yeah, a lot of what I'm talking about is exactly what is expounded upon in the animated materials, where you get to see more of the in-between stuff where the the three live actions were were set to show how does Anakin go from Anakin to Darth Vader. And to me... And this is my 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 personal op- uh, opinion on this. I know that there are Anakin Skywalker fans out there, and if you are, awesome, whatever. That that that's cool. For me, that's not really the compelling story. Tell that in the periphery and all of that. But to me, the more compelling story is you have this ancient enemy of the Jedi that was thought to be dead for so long, and then is 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 coming back. And now has this prolific killer at, among their ranks that literally was just stalking Jedi for fun. Just so that way you learn in some of the extended materials that Darth Maul is it literally would just stalk Jedi so that way he could prove that Jedi couldn't tell that he was coming. Now if you if you read some of the some of the extended materials or watch some of the stuff it in my opinion really makes more of the phantom menace mean more because you have this moment of being blindsided where where Qui-Gon and uh Obi-Wan are blindsided by this robed figure who comes out of nowhere and you come to realize that that's actually something that he set he t- he put time and intention and practice in being able to do that. So that way, when the time came, he could spring an attack and take out more Jedi. And he he went on a whole pilgrimage, just murdering Jedi. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's, it actually speaks to his character development that he gets because of the Clone Wars. He, he loses a lot of that ego. Uh, Dying will do that to you, apparently. But he loses a lot of that, oh, I'll just stalk this Jedi and then kill them. If you watch the Clone Wars and Rebels, you'll see he actually, he works with quite a few Jedi uh, just because they're not Obi-Wan. Right. Because that's no longer his concern. He doesn't want to kill all the Jedi. He just wants to kill Obi-Wan. You get to see him work with Ahsoka, 
who is one of the other better characters in the Clone Wars. And he he actually tries to take Ezra under his wing. He decides he wants to try and steal Kanan's apprentice, uh, which I just thought was pretty funny. But even the conclusion to Darth Maul's story where he does, you know, obviously, spoiler warning, but uh, in his final fight, uh, season four of Rebels, season three or four, he does get to finally have his rematch with Obi-Wan Kenobi, old man Ben at that point. And it's, you lose all of the flash. There is no more, you know, flourishes. It's not fancy. And to me, it's the best duel in Star Wars and the visual media, at least, because you can see Obi-Wan, despite it being so long ago, didn't lose, you know, I don't, I'm trying to think of the word, but he remembers what it felt like when he lost Qui-Gon. Right. And you can see he goes from his stance, you know, the classic Obi-Wan Kenobi form to stance to Qui-Gon's stance just to you know pierce that protective shell around Darth Maul's ego that he built up to goad him into attacking him the way he attacked Qui-Gon and that's all Obi-Wan needed yeah and I think one of the things that I appreciate the most about Darth Maul is you you learn as his story is is unfolded that he was kind of born and bred for this life the emperor he makes a deal with the Night Sisters, and he ends up in in care of this child and raises this child to be his apprentice, to be basically the ultimate Jedi killer. And yeah, we see a couple of different um, apprentices along the way that, that the Emperor has, but pound for pound, short of the four five and six version of vader this is the most menacing out of any of them that that he's the only one that even comes close to original vader and because you 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 can feel for this character right and that's what they tried to do with anakin and um, depends on who you ask as far as how successful they were about building sympathy for this character and all of that. I would argue that for somebody like Vader, all of the sympathy that you needed was built out of Luke. I just, but I'm also a Homer for four, five and six and the, the legends continuity. So for me, Luke is my guy as far as on the Jedi side. I think that he is, the the pinnacle, if that's what you're looking at, as far as being a Jedi, I think first is Luke, just by sheer volume of experience uh, of experience that we have with the character, and second is Qui Gon. I think Qui Gon in the Legends continuity, uh, I oh such a such a, a missed opportunity, and I understand that that's literally the thesis statement behind why everything goes down the way it goes down is you know, Qui-Gon being the the catalyst or Qui-Gon's death being the catalyst for that. I understand. But for me, the whole idea of a gray Jedi that in between the light side and the dark side, that's the sweet stuff. That's that that's the special sauce that that really you can tell longevity of story with. And that is exactly what you had with Qui-Gon. You know what I mean? And so for for me getting a chance to see you know this this child that doesn't really have a chance to grow up and all he knows is hatred and all he knows is death and the dark side and then to have his whole purpose ripped away from him by somebody that he views as being essentially the scum of the earth in a jedi that a jedi bested him now he goes from being raised in hate and darkness to having the opportunity to live out his mission and then to be thwarted and to go even deeper into hate and darkness and seeing how that kind of all-encompassing I hate all Jedi being distilled down to I hate this man, that is such 
there, there's there's a lot to the nuance of his character in building him into this route of almost being sympathetic in a way, but being sympathetic in an entirely different way than how Vader ended up at the end of Return of the Jedi. And that's why, for me, it's such a beautiful comparison because while, yes, at surface level, you are comparing two of, I'll say it, the greatest Sith in this era of Star Wars that you're still comparing at certain levels, apples to oranges, because they are two different characters and walked two different paths. Yeah, it's, I think just in general, because we got so much more time with Darth Maul, uh, if, you know, if you watch the Clone Wars, he becomes a much more sympathetic character because we get to see him go through loss. He loses his brothers. Uh, we get to see him struggle with finding his purpose, uh, yeah. failure, all kinds of things. Um, he tries to revolt against Darth Sidious. Doesn't go well. Shocker. Does not go well for him. And we get to see him survive and come up with something else. He just keeps struggling on until finally the man he hates the most frees him from this cycle. Yeah. Which I think is poetic. It is very, it is very poetic. And Darth Maul is one of those characters for me that really embodies a lot of what I love about Star Wars. Now, whether it, whether your series of Star Wars movies was four, five, and six, one, two, or three, or seven, eight, and nine, generally people, if you talk to people about these, these series of movies, when they talk about it, it's baked, there's a, there's a level of nostalgia baked into it. There's memories associated with these movies that make them what they are to the individuals that they are that too. And so for me, I remember being a little kid watching just the sheer size and magnitude of Star Wars. This was the first IP that I came across that was larger than life in a lot of regards. And we were spoiled. Those of us that grew up before the prequel trilogy, we were spoiled because in my opinion, we got some of the very best storytelling that Star Wars had to offer and some of the very best character storytelling that Star Wars had to offer. But that's also me. And that's my, that's my four, five, and six are my trilogy. And so that, of course, I'm going to be more attuned to saying that. So as, as time has gone on and I've watched this, I, I've watched some of the extended materials and I've watched particular characters grow and all of that. For me, I, I so appreciate a character like Darth Maul because to me, Darth Maul is a character that allows for, for that to be realized once again. For for that depth of size and nuance and extended universe and extended storytelling to be realized because Darth Maul, through Darth Maul, you get to see more of the goings on in the periphery to this Clone War battle, to this light side versus dark side in the Jedi aspect of it. Yes, it does cross paths with the Jedi battle that's going on, this, this Jedi versus Sith battle, but he ends up becoming a figurehead in the underground criminal world of Star Wars. That ends up being way more of his world, and then eventually that brings him back into crossing paths with Obi-Wan. And mm -hmm. so all along the way, Darth Maul is flushing out a whole other world of the Star Wars universe that isn't being expressed or explored through the main conflict. Yeah, uh, he also becomes Mandalore, the ruler of Mandalore, which is awesome. He, he Darth Maul's story feels like playing a star wars rpg like oh, you, you start off as a sith and then you're a crime lord and then you're the king of mandalore and then a bunch of other things that there's no reason you should have been able to achieve right but that's just what you get when you're watching the coolest character in the series yeah yeah and 
just there there's so many there's so many individual moments that you can point to that just whether whether it's action based storytelling based or what have you 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 have you take take your pick because you get all of it through this character you know what i mean and that's that's just at the storytelling level right for me i what what brings me to the dance now in my 30s watching this stuff is characters that that can tell something something deeper that that dare to explore the boundaries of existence and 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 dare to um show the messy nuance in gray area of what existence is like even if it's in a fantastical version where there's space wizards and there's lightsaber duels and there's all these different alien races and all of that kind of stuff it still brings it to a relatable level when you can look at this character and you can say okay darth maul was a tortured soul that was driven so very heavily by hate and by vengeance and that was a thing that that really um dictated his life and then what that looks like when that person who is so driven by hate finally does have a relationship with somebody finally can relate with a family member a mother a brother and then loses them and all he's left with is the baggage of hate and how that was just it was it was instilled in him he never had a chance to know anything other than hate and vengeance that's compelling story because to me i look around and i've seen enough of life that i i i see people i know people that while they're not going out and murdering people for a sport or anything like that they are hateful people because that was all that was instilled in them from a young age they never had a chance to authentically and actually know love or to know the freedom that comes in laying down the baggage of vengeance and all of those kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, perfect character to me. He also, he gets, I think he's the closest anyone comes to being a gray Jedi other than Ahsoka Tano. Uh, really just at the end. Are we talking about the, are we talking about the mainline continuity? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not the let because the legends are way different. We could do another episode because they're better. Uh, but which tune in if depending on how everything uh, everything works out, just a little pellet wetter. Uh, there may in fact be an episode on the docket exploring these different extended universes of some of our favorite IPs. So to or uh, stay tuned for that. Right, but. In the final few episodes of the Clone Wars, you get to see him helping Ahsoka Tano. You can say maybe it was just in the interest of self-preservation, but in Rebels, we see that he actually kind of cared about these people. And you get to see him just absolutely destroy a, a star cruiser from the inside with the Force, which is awesome. Once again, the character is awesome. Can't yeah, say that and enough. And that's part of why I didn't like Tyrannus nearly as much, or otherwise known as Count Dooku. Um, because, yes, there there is story to be told because of his connection with Qui-Gon and all of those kinds of things. Yes, he tells a different part of the story. But when, when you're a, a, a preteen into teenage years as these movies are coming out and you start the conversation with Darth Maul and then you go to a stuffy old guy. Now, don't get me wrong. In my years and in, in my cinephile development sense, I have come to understand him as an actor and understand, oh, just how ridiculously good of an actor Count Dooku is in all of his different things that he's been, that he's been in throughout the throughout the decades, right? But I, I just it, it, you lost something when when you you ended up with this guy who who is this guy like this this guy is not this is not what i signed up for you know what i mean and to to for 
when you look at the the life cycle of Darth Maul, I think what's what's beautiful about the storytelling is you see along the way that you can be driven by something along the way end up with with more of a of a nuanced look that maybe it's not that black and white maybe there are shades of gray to it but still be so all consumed by that one singular purpose that even though you see that there are shades of gray you are so dominated by that one singular thing that that one singular thing still ends up being your downfall and this character this tortured soul doesn't get a nice redemption arc gets a little i mean it depends on what uh, on you you know you can like like tj said you can argue that there are shades of redemption to his story but ultimately there isn't this clean cut going from bad guy to good guy character arc that takes place here he does not end up that way and actually it's it's kind of funny because you look at you look at the the level of mental warfare that goes into the duel between he and obi-wan it's it's so it, it it's so layered because you just you have Obi-Wan that doesn't that doesn't want to give him the satisfaction and you have Maul that's like, hey, I murdered your master in cold blood and is just sitting there needling him to get him to to fight him. It's not even a matter anymore of like bringing him over to the dark side or anything like that. It's literally just about vengeance and about mm -hmm. an eye for an eye sort of thing. Yeah. And they never uh, people never really talk about how smart Darth Maul is. Right. Like Darth Maul might be one of the smartest characters in the series. He yeah. just never got to show it in the Phantom Menace. So people didn't really know that. Uh, he kills, uh, Sa not Sabine, Satel, not Satel. I can never remember her name. Obi-Wan's love interest in the Clone Wars. Mandalorian Duchess woman. Satine? Yes, Satine. There you go. It's Satine. Not just because that's who he cares about. But because he knows that preying on that split from the Jedi code is going to get to Obi-Wan more than anything else. Because Obi-Wan, you know, went off the path like that and executing on that weakness of Obi-Wan's is going to get to him. And it does. We see that. Yeah, it's it's there's almost, you know, everybody talks about the foil to Obi-Wan being Vader. And in some ways, I can see it, but to me, more of the foil for Obi-Wan is Maul, because both of these guys were so dedicated to their position. Obi-Wan is who he is, not because of somebody like Anakin, and not because he's somebody like Anakin. Anakin is, is an example of born talent. You know, somebody who who has all of the genetic disposition to be good at what he does. Obi-Wan was very average and everything that he got was through sheer practice and going harder than anybody else at honing his craft. That's what made him a master. Darth Maul was so encompassed with the agenda of the dark side that to him, Obi-Wan took him off of his path, took him off from his ultimate destiny. And Maul exploiting that moment of um, lack of clarity in Obi-Wan and capitalizing on that is the, the perfect move of mental, uh, of mental chess that's going on between these two that is so emblematic of the fact that these t these two characters are so three-dimensional and four-dimensional that there's a reason why two guys from two different generations who grew up in two different contexts are still talking about these characters years after the fact. Yeah, and we could probably talk about them again in another year and say something else. Yeah. Yeah. And that's to me, you know, 
I am I am of I am of the type that I I love that I I love when things when messy stories are told. Don't get me wrong, we all love a good hero story. You know, we all love the the clear cut hero story. But even even the most clear cut of hero stories, if if you look at them, there's still some mess to them. You look at Return of the Jedi. Yes, it is a hero's journey. It is the ending, it is the capstone of a hero's journey. However, you still have a war-torn galaxy. You still have this rebel alliance and, and part of this group that, that devoted their lives to the Emperor, and that's what makes Dark Empire the extended the extension from Return of the Jedi in the Legends continuity so stinking good because it explores that and it lives there. Um that I just because because it allows for us to be able to ask these questions, right? And I think especially for us as believers, you know, for there, there's, there's a whole group of people that are believers that ha- will have no idea what I'm talking about. And honestly, honestly, awesome that you have, n- that if, if you, if you have grown up in a context where you have never seen the depths of what hatred can do and unforgive it and unforgiveness and all of those kinds of things, if you've never seen that, awesome because you know what it is oh some of the worst that this world has to offer and doesn't tend to lead to anything good but we can't stick our heads in the sand and ignore the fact that this is a thing and and i think one i think if we're honest with ourselves seeing reflections of that in media allows for for nuance that isn't otherwise that isn't otherwise there because it reflects aspects of things that we can honestly relate to and people that we can honestly relate to. You know, you see uh, by the end of Maul's journey, you almost you're you know, you're you're almost hoping that oh, okay, he's finally going to get it. He's finally going to understand that yes, the dark side and and Palpatine specifically and and that extreme, yeah, no, that's wrong. But then also the Jedi and their extreme, they've got it wrong. And that there's this beautiful middle ground that is, is rich and nuanced that you can live in. And that, okay, maybe I can turn away. I can turn from all of these things that I've done and all of these things that I've been through. Maybe, just maybe, I can have some peace. And that is what makes his end so heartbreaking because he doesn't get there. He doesn't, he doesn't get to actually living that out. He's still so driven by his vendetta that while there's shades of that, that's never, that, that's never fully and actually realized. And that, that should be resonant. That should be something that, that, that speaks to the soul of the individual watching because that, that, that's the name of the game. That's literally the, na- the showing people that there is a better way, that there is freedom, right? To, 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 to be able to taste and see that the Lord is good and showing people that, that, they, can, that they can turn from, it doesn't matter what you've done. Yeah, we all have a rap sheet. We all have a list of things that we have done three miles long, but, but that's not the end of the story. And, and you know, yeah, again, this is there, there's there's aspects of this that are fantastical. There's aspects of this that are that 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 are not depending on which which one you're talking about. But at the end of the day, what we're seeing here is is, again, a reflection of truth in, in a media that we all love. And, and the more especially this year. Between Narnia, between an increased look at some of the aspects of Star Wars, because we've been doing a lot of Star Wars content this year and and all of that, this stuff, this stuff tells some of the most compelling stories that there is because there's because there's reflections of truth into it, because we can look at these things and we can say, man, there there's there's shades of nuance here that that jump off the page because aspects of it are applicable to real life. You know you've done, you know, you know you've preached well when TJ is just, yep, just shaking his head. Yep. It's true. So as we let's let's go ahead and uh and head into the wrap up, all right? 
So, TJ, what have you been geeking out on and what recommendations do you have for our lovely listeners? I have been geeking out on Guilty Gear Strive because I convinced some friends to download it. And I love fighting games. Great way to spend time. Guilty Gear Strive might be the best one I've ever played. Oh, boy. It's fantastic. Try it out. It looks gorgeous. It's so smooth. It's just complex enough. Uh, But our listeners, I recommend go to YouTube, type in all Darth Maul duels, and just watch those videos. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a a killer recommendation. So I... My my geeking out and my recommendation are one and the same. Um, I I love audiobooks. I uh, and there I've recently stumbled upon the fact that a lot of the extended universe Star Wars books are free on YouTube. Now, if if you can, if you can support the support the industry, all of those kinds of things, but. Go on YouTube and you can find Dark Empire all on there. That's my recommendation. There's more on there than just Dark Empire, but it's set in the time after Return of the Jedi. And you're exploring the lives of Han, Leia, Luke, Chewie, Lando, and you're ex- and you're introduced to more people along the way. And Oh, it's just so good. And and it's serialized storytelling in a way that if you like four, five, and six, it the 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 three parts of Dark Empire are set up pretty similarly as far as how the stories are told. So go to YouTube, type in Dark Empire, and you'll be able to hear the audiobooks. They're free on there. Um, I've been going, I finished those three and I've moved on to some of the, um, the old Republic books that are out there and all of that kind of stuff, which is an entirely other conversation, but guys jump, jump into the legends continuity. Like if you've, if you've exhausted the, what you've watched out of star Wars, uh, jump into the legends continuity, because I'll say it. My one hot, my obligatory hot take for every single episode. This is this is mine here. The Legends continuity is better than what's happening on Disney Plus by true. far and away. There's not even a candle. Yeah, true. Read the Darth Bane series. Oh man, to to see to see some of the some of the roots pre Emperor Palpatine pre Plagueis is just oh. It's so good because you you see how the rule of two came about. You see why the Sith are like this. And don't get me wrong. I think Palpatine is an awesome character. But to see what shaped the the setting for him to be able to step into is, is fantastic. And likewise, to see both pre and post mainline Jedi is awesome because it gives you a better idea of just how fallen the Jedi order was during one, two, and three, like one, two, and three told at least some kind of story about how fallen they were, but to be able to see the other periphery stuff only, only enhances what happens in the mainline movies, at least one through six. Seven, eight, and nine. If you like them, awesome. But yeah, un, uh, for the, for sake of this conversation, those aren't really a part of this conversation at all. And for all of you, just to just to to throw a last cherry on top, one of the one of the chief. If you've never read or listened to any of the Legends continuity, one of the biggest complaints about seven, eight, and nine that I hear from people is why couldn't we have seen the power couple? of Han and Leia that we saw like this, this nigh divorced couple and all of this kind of stuff. Why couldn't we see them together guys in dark empire? You see exactly that everything that you wanted to see out of seven, eight and nine, you can see in dark empire and the extended stuff beyond that. 
So that's a wrap for now. If you have listened to this and you would just, you find yourself just, just needing more of our sultry tones, you can head on over to systematicecology.org and navigate over to the host tab and be able to see all of the absurd amount of projects that we are all involved in. And if you would like to help us keep the lights on, you can head on over to patreon.com slash systematic ecology. We have tons of bonus materials over there for you guys to give you guys value and to say thank you for supporting us. That is all for now, but I leave you with this. Remember, we are all a chosen people, a geekdom of priests. This was an Anazao Ministries podcast. If you enjoyed this show and would like to learn more about our network, be sure to check out the Anazao Ministries podcast network.